what would have happened if it had been three wise women instead of three wise men? Now, I know this email comes every single year around Christmas time. It comes uh, in emails, it comes on Facebook, you sometimes see it or hear it on the radio, but it's a good question. What would have happened if it had been three wise women instead of three wise men? Uh -huh. <laughs> they would have asked directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and brought practical gifts. Although, I'm sorry, gold is a very practical <laughs> gift. But what's usually not included in these emails is something that came this year from a friend on Facebook. After those statements, it then said, but what they would have said, what did they say, or what would they have said if they were three for wise women, what would they have said when they left? Did you see the sandals Mary was wearing under that gown? That baby doesn't look a bit like Joseph. Can you believe that they let all those animals into the house? I heard that Joseph isn't even working right now. Uh-huh. Oh, the stories and the jokes, the imagery, the artistry, the music, the songs the traditions about the wise men, the wise guys, the magi, the three kings. There are lots of myths about them. First of all, you see them usually in pageants and plays at Christmas time, but they don't belong to Christmas. They belong to Epiphany today. So let's take a look at some of these myths to begin with. Contrary to what we see in artwork and movies and plays and pageants, and even in the hymn, We Three Kings, nowhere in the Bible does it say that there were three of them. Huh? Yep. Nowhere in your Bible, nowhere in the reading from Matthew, which is printed in your bulletin today, take a look at it if you don't believe me, nowhere in the Bible does it say that there were three wise men. It says that there were three gifts, not three wise wise men, not three kings, not three magi, three gifts. There could have been, now there had to be more than one, because it's plural, but there could have been two, or there could have been twenty, or there could have been three, or anywhere in between or beyond. But nowhere in Scripture does it say there were three wise men. That comes from the, the song, We Three Kings, it comes from the artistry of the icons and paintings and tapestries we've seen. It comes from nativity sets with three kings, one with each, each one with a gift, one of the gifts. It comes from the pageants that we see. We always get one guy with the Burger King crown that has been spray painted gold, kind of like we had. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That comes from tradition that there were three kings, not Bible. It's not Bible that says there were three kings. It's not Bible that says there were three wise men. It's tradition. It's art. It's music. It's song. Not Bible, but there were three gifts. Secondly, are they kings, astrologers, wise guys, or what? Or are they all of the above? They were from Persia, which is modern-day Iran, which is east of Israel. And they were probably Zoroastrian priests, which means they were very well-versed in astronomy and astrology and in the traditions and the religious lore of other nations, of other peoples. So they were aware of what the expectations about the Messiah were amongst the Jews. They were aware of the importance of the return in the establishment of the kingdom of David. They had heard about all this stuff, and they saw in the sky portents that they said identified the birth 
of a king in Israel. And so they came to find out and to identify and worship this king. And in most works of art, in most plays, in most movies, and even in songs, they're usually depicted as going to the birth scene. And as I said just a minute ago, he doesn't belong to the birth scene. They don't belong to the birth event. They don't belong in the manger scene. Because it says not that they came at the time of birth when Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were out in that stable, out in that garage behind the Motel 6 there in Bethlehem, uh, in that cave, which is what it was, where they kept the animals and the, 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 the uh, especially the donkeys of those who were transients in the community. No, it says that it came to them when they were, they came to them when they were in a house. The three wise men came and visited Mary and Jesus when they were in a house. It's a different word in Greek. It can't possibly be the manger. So while we depict it with the shepherds and the sheep and the star and the angels singing glory to God in the highest and the little drummer boy and all that other stuff, no. The Bible does not depict it. The Bible does not depict them as coming to Jesus and Mary on the morning of his birth. But maybe months, possibly even a couple of years, as many as two years based on the age at which uh, King Herod the Great demanded that the babies of Bethlehem be killed beneath. He could have been at least two years old. So those are some of the myths about the three wise men, which kind of point us then to the gifts. If there weren't three wise men, the Bible is very clear there were three gifts. Gold, Frankenstein, and myrrh, right? When I was a kid, I thought it was Frankenstein, and I was so disappointed that you never had the Frankenstein monster there. No. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were the three gifts. A couple of years ago, I got this gift, and on the cover it said, the gifts of the wise men. And I thought, oh boy, some gold. No. A beautiful wooden box with some gold inlay, but not, no, no gold. But inside, you do find some frankincense and some myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh are both resins. They're both incense. They're hard crusty little bits of sap that have come from a tree and they're used to create incense. Frankincense especially was used in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem to burn offerings up to God. They would take the incense, they would pour it onto hot coals and it would immediately flash and vaporize and generate this wafting smoke that would arise as a sweet-smelling offering unto God. And it would symbolize the presence of the Almighty in the Holy of Holies, in the temple in Jerusalem. It would symbolize the presence of Almighty God and the prayers of the people as they wafted up to God. And then there's myrrh, which when you would be burning the incense, in the Holy of Holies and you wanted to add a nice pleasant little uh, touch to the odor, you would take the myrrh, which are the darker crystals, and throw them in with the frankincense and they become a perfume which wafts up to Almighty God along with the burning incense. It was used in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. It was used in churches across 2,000 years in worship, in Christian churches. Um, we're going to experience it here at Northgate, say around Pentecost, as an experience of something different in worship. Now, you think, oh, smoke, it'll make me choke. No, incense doesn't 
frankincense doesn't make you choke. It breathes clear. It's more like smelling salts than anything else. It breathes clear. And when you add in the perfume of the myrrh, it adds a special zing to it. And in worship, in Christian worship, it is used to symbolize the presence of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the prayers of the people as they rise to God. These are the three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, throughout the history of the church, there's been the question about these gifts. I mean, they're not very practical except for the gold, considering the trip that they were getting ready to make to Egypt. Other than that, they're not all that practical, are they? Unless you've smelled a baby when you're changing the diaper, I'm, that, that frankincense might be helpful. Kind of like potpourri. But, put it simply, they are not that practical of gifts. Instead, Matthew meant them a specific way. Matthew meant them to be symbolic. Matthew meant them to c communicate an idea, to communicate a concept or a series of concepts about who this Jesus is, about what this Jesus does, about what Jesus does for us, and what we are supposed to do and be. And the church has taken its cue from Matthew in his using these three gifts and has talked about the nature of Jesus and about what we're called to do. So let's look at the three gifts. The first gift is gold. Gold. The gift of kings. Now, I've often wondered, why would you give gold to a king? They already got all the gold. It ought to be a gift that the king gives to us. But gold is a property of royalty, power, majesty. It speaks about the value and worth of that which has it. And in this sense, gold speaks about the divinity or power and kingship of Jesus. Jesus is the new David, establishing the new kingdom of David. Hence, Jesus is our king. In the gift of gold we have proclaimed, Jesus is our king. In the gift of frankincense, used in worship, used to symbolize the presence of God, used to symbolize the prayers of the people wafting up to God, in the frankincense we have the proclamation, in gold he is our king, in frankincense he is our God. In gold he is our king, in frankincense he is the presence of Almighty God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is Yeshua, Yahweh delivers, Yahweh saves. In the gold he is king, he is preeminent, preeminent position in the world. In frankincense, he is God. And in myrrh, myrrh was used to bury the dead. Myrrh was used not just to enliven the frankincense in burning it in the temple, it was used also to prepare the dead for burial. So, in myrrh we have the humanity of Jesus. Jesus was a man like you and me. Jesus was human like all of us. He, he was born, he lived, and he died. He stretched out his arms on the hardwood of the cross and died for us. So gold, he is king. Frankincense, he is God. And myrrh, he is human. He is God, He is human, and He is our King. These three gifts speak about the nature of Jesus. They are Christological gifts pointing to who Jesus is for us. King, He's our boss, He's our ruler, He's our Lord. Frankincense, He is our God, the presence of Almighty God with us, Emmanuel, Yeshua, and indeed, sacrifice. And then myrrh, he is human. 
He lives among us, and He will die for us as our sacrifice and be buried. So the gifts foreshadow who He is, proclaim who He is, point out who He is. God, King, and sacrifice. God, human, and king. Powerful imagery here. Now, the church hasn't stopped there. The church has also looked at these three gifts as not only telling us about Jesus, but also telling us about us, about what we as Christians are supposed to do. The first gift, gold, means not just that we're supposed to give our money to God, we're supposed to give the best that we have in our when we join the church, when we become a member of the body of Christ, we commit ourselves to giving. Yes, of financial resources, but most especially of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. And those gifts are manifold. We're, we, we, we dedicate ourselves to being present in worship, to praying for the life of the church, for serving within the church the children of God, in and beyond the church. We, we commit ourselves to witnessing to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we give our very best in doing it, our gold, the very best that we have in our. Your very best is your gold, not just money, your gifts, your graces, your talents the things that God has given you to give and share with others. Your gold, your very best. We're called to give it to God. Secondly, frankincense. The prayers of the people. We're called to gather in and worship together, not forsake the gathering together of the saints and to worship Almighty God. We're called to lift our prayers to heaven, partake of the means of grace, hear the word proclaimed, and then go forth and do the third gift. The first gift is giving our best. The second gift is praying and praising God. The third gift is then to do the works of God. Myrrh, that Jesus was human, we are human too. The sacrifice that Christ made, depicted in the myrrh, also the sacrifice we make, the reaching out and becoming the body of Christ for a broken and hurting world, becoming the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and the lips of Jesus. St. Teresa of Avila, one of the early doctors of the church universal, Teresa of Avila wrote a beautiful prayer, a prayer that John Michael Talbot back in the 1900s turned into a wonderful song. I won't sing it for you, but I'll read it for you today. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks. Compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands... Yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. That's the myrrh. We are called to be the body of Christ, expressing the love of God to and for all. We are called to be the body of Christ, giving our very best, our gold. Praising God in worship and prayer, our frankincense. And serving God by serving the children of God and being the hands and the feet of God and the eyes and the ears and the lips of God, the heart of Jesus Christ in this world, the body of Christ here and now, our myrrh. We're called to give our three gifts to God too. So in these three gifts, we have an understanding of who Jesus is, 
king, God, and human, and indeed our sacrifice. And then in these three gifts, we have an understanding of what we are called to do and be. We're called to give our best, to praise God, and to serve as the body of Christ in this world. In this year, 2013, I want to encourage all of us to commit ourselves and submit ourselves to being the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and the lips of Jesus. I've said that many times here. I'm saying it again. We are the body of Christ, and we may be the only Jesus that some people will ever see. We're called to live our lives in love of God, in service to God, giving our very best and all to God, and then reaching out as the body of Christ to love others in Jesus' name. This year, let's commit ourselves to this calling anew, afresh. And when you come to the table of the Lord, Allow the Holy Spirit so to fill you anew and afresh that you do indeed become transformed, transfigured, transubstantiated into the body of Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. my own but thine put me to what thou wilt rank me with whom thou wilt put me to doing put me to suffering let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee or brought low by thee let me be full let me be empty let me have all things let me have nothing I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh gracious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it, and the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. By your grace, you have called and empowered us to be the light of the world, a living expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ for this broken and hurting world. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when he would save your people. He healed the sick, 
fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and exemplified the amazing love of God for all by stretching out his arms on the hardwood of the cross and dying for the sins of the whole world. Through his real presence, he delivers us from slavery to sin and death and empowers us for service as his hands and feet, eyes, ears, and lips, making us a holy city on a hill, shining the light of God's love to all. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave the cup to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In your presence, Lord, let me learn at your feet. I will taste the riches of You have been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of Northgate United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2013 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information or to listen to other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at Northgate United Methodist Church, 3700 West Northgate Drive, Irving, Texas, 75062. This program was produced by Dr. Gregory Neal.